I know I'm talking fast, but I only have an hour. Any questions so far? We're done with behavior. We're going to move on, move on to early intervention and identification, vice versa. Okay. So early intervention and identification. Identification first. Early identification is about discovering things that are atypical sooner than later. So we don't want to wait until things have gotten out of control before we provide support. If you have high blood pressure, you don't want to wait until you're in the hospital because you can't breathe and your heart's beating so fast to get help. As soon as you know something's going on, you want the medicine. Same thing when it comes to our children. So the CDC has a checklist of all the developmental milestones that you can look for in your younger children. So this is from two months to five years old. Now, when you take your child in for their wellness checks, the doctors normally go through these milestones anyway. But in case you're curious about what those milestones are, um, I have the link here. So if they share the PowerPoint with you, you'll be able to click. But I also... I'm scared this will mess everything up. But I also pulled it up here just so you can see. There we go. Okay. So you can see here it's the Center for Disease Control. So it's a reputable website that's important to pay attention to. It has two months, four months, six months, all the way down to five years old. So if we pick three years old, dun, dun, dun. all right, it will show the important milestones for a child who is three. And... You can read through the different categories and everything. But like I said, the link is here. So if you want to go through and see what your child, your younger child should be doing, you can do that. Okay. During those checkups, it's great if you look ahead of time for what those developmental milestones should be. So you can kind of look at your child and say, hmm, you're four and you're not walking. On here, it says you should be walking around one to one and a half years old. We need to go check on that. And hopefully you're not waiting till they're four for walking. Um, when it comes to talking, sometimes children don't talk until they're three or four years old. And that's not always a problem, especially here in the UAE. There's so many multilingual children that knowing a second language, learning a second, third, fourth language, which we see a lot here, can cause a language delay. But it's not because anything is wrong. The brain is really trying to decipher between all the languages. So the child is just choosing not to talk. They're just waiting until they know what's going on, but they usually can understand what you're saying. So don't be alarmed if you're speaking Arabic at home. Maybe your husband is from France, so there's French going on. Then they go to school and everything's in English. And at home, they're just kind of like, I don't want to say anything. Or they're not talking as fluently as another child who only speaks one language. Just know that language takes a while to develop, and you really don't have to worry a lot about that until six to eight years old. That's when things start to balance out. So don't worry. Um, but be sure to share any concerns with your doctor. I can't highlight that enough. Don't feel shameful. Don't feel like um, I'm embarrassed because something's wrong with my child. The sooner you can get them supports, the better. Um, there's developmental screenings for autism, if you're worried about autism, as early as nine months and 18 months and even at 30 months. So if that's something you're worried about and you don't think your doctor is checking for that, you can ask for them to screen for autism early on. Please don't wait. The sooner, the better. Okay, so there's some pros and some cons to early identification. The pros are on the left side. So, of course, there's sooner access to support. There's more positive outcomes because we can help them early. Young children up to the age of five, their brain is so adaptable. So if you can catch different learning issues or different developmental issues early, it's it's more likely that they're going to have a successful outcome. Um, there's a, it fosters a stimulating environment because they're able to get the supports they need soon, which can change their behaviors and their neural cognition pathways. So the sooner you can get help for your child, the better. And it's cost and time effective because if you wait till later and when things are more severe, you're going to need more supports and more often have the supports. The sooner you start, the sooner you can start making things better before they get worse. Now, the cons, which can be, they don't outweigh the pros, but it's possible there's a wrong diagnosis. Because, like I said, if you're worried about your child having a language delay and you go in when they're four years old because they're not talking and the doctor says, bam, your child has a language processing disorder. 
Well, now they've been labeled with a language processing disorder when really they're learning four languages right now or even two languages right now. And just give them a moment, give them a moment to catch up. So yes, be concerned and yes, go ask, but please hold off on labels and complete diagnoses until you really know if that's the issue. Um, you have to also consider your, your as a parent. So like I said, I have three children. All children develop at different levels and different pace. Different, different. So you don't want to look at your child and say, hmm, you're barely reading at five and my friend's child is five and she's reading at a second grade level. I think you might have dyslexia. We don't want to compare our children with other children and we don't want to compare them with siblings. Let your child develop at their pace and try not to project your parental expectation onto your child. Even if they're older and they're not understanding algebra or their science or whatever, give them time, see if they want a tutor, you know, give them time to come into their own rather than saying, well, when I was your age, I did this, or so-and-so is the same age as you and they're doing that. We really don't want to compare our children with other children. And I already mentioned the labeling theory earlier. It's a personal choice on if you want to have your child labeled, so to speak. So if your child does have, say, attentional deficit hyperactivity disorder, they have ADHD. When a child is five, I personally, this is me, don't feel it's necessary to tell my child you have ADHD. We're going to work on strategies together. We're going to see how you learn best. I'm going to let you know that your mind is just different than some people, but it's so awesome and creative. I don't need to tell them, oh, baby, I'm sorry, you've been diagnosed with ADHD, and then go through all the deficits, because there's so many superpowers, we like to say, about the different learning disabilities and attentional issues, that that label can be very stigmatizing, and the label can also be um, discouraging to the child. Now, the label is important to get the right supports, but sharing that label with the child isn't always the most important, um, but don't be scared of getting the label so that you can get the child help. Okay, here's some red flags. I won't read them all because I know all of you know how to read, um, but you can look at some of the red flags for well-being. I have ages zero to five, five to 10, and ages 10 to 19. Basically, you want to look for some of these red flags happening for more than one to two weeks. You don't want it to be, oh, today she was, my child was super aggressive and was throwing chairs everywhere. Let me take them because they have emotional disturbance disorder. Give it time, see if something's going on, especially now with COVID and our children have been isolated a lot more, which really does hurt development and uh, self-esteem and having your friend interaction and social interaction. So you wanna look for these things, especially the 10 to 19 are teenage girls and teenage boys. A lot of times they might have different eating habits and it could be anorexia, it could be bulimia, maybe they feel like they're fat, Maybe they feel like, you know, I'm too skinny. You want to monitor how your children are doing and kind of pay attention to, are they eating? Are they sleeping enough? Are they in the room on their phone the whole night and then going to school and being sleepy? It's really important that all children get plenty of sleep, that they go to bed at the same time, have those routines, but look for these red flags in your child to see if something could be going on that you haven't noticed. Um, as a parent, you know best for your child and you know how they act the best. So if that something's not right, talk with them. If it's still not right, they don't want to open up, feel free to go see a counselor or a psychologist or um, just someone they're willing to talk to. It could be an auntie, just to try to get them to open up before um, things get worse than they are. Okay, so some common mental health concerns among youth are anxiety disorders, especially now during COVID. These things have all increased. There's been a lot of anxiety around, can I leave my house? Will I die if I get COVID? Um, I'm so worried about touching something. I need to wear gloves and a mask. And, and there's some people, I, I've had friends who their children didn't want to leave the house for six months because they were just so anxious and worried about what could happen once they go out into the world and to germs, you know? And there's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This is very common among youth, as well as autism. It is more pronounced now as we get a firmer grasp and definition of what autism is. And there's such a big spectrum that the prevalence or the occurrence of autism is on the rise. 
as well as depression and mood disorders. So as we've been talking through um, being disobedient, not wanting to be around friends, maybe eating problems, they're not sleeping well, these can all be indications of possible depression or anxiety. So we really want to pay attention to the normal behavior of our child and what's not the same, what's going on. Again, like I said, eating disorders, there's also learning disabilities, but again, take your time diagnosing those things, especially if your child is multilingual. Um, just give them some time to balance out all those languages before you think it's dyslexia, especially with the Arab language, the Arabic language, because you write the opposite way. So if they're reversing their letters when they write, that doesn't automatically point to dyslexia. Dyslexia is more of a language processing disorder than writing things backwards. It's a lot deeper than just writing things backwards. There's also post-traumatic stress disorder. And again, with COVID-19, more children are actually having this type of disorder because so many family members may have passed away in such a quick amount of time. There's a lot of um, displaced citizens here who have come from war and torn countries. So they've seen things that no one should see, especially a child. So there could be some PTSD going on that can cause other behaviors to happen in the child or even eating disorders, um, traumas where they don't want to sleep, they don't want to sleep in the dark, you know, just different things. And the last one is schizophrenia, which is common among youth, not common like um, ADHD or a learning disability, but it is one of the mental health concerns that is common among youth. So here's some ways you can help your child. Okay. Educate yourself, please educate yourself. If something's going on, yes, we all go to Google, but please um, make sure it's a reputable resource, not Wikipedia. You wanna make sure that it's like the CDC or different universities or published research papers. You wanna make sure you're getting good information. I'm not gonna read these again because I don't like reading PowerPoint slides, but what I find is the most important is you as the parent are the example and the you're the attitude of the house. If the parent feels anxious and they're always irritable and they're yelling all the time, it's going to make the house very tense. So the best way to support your child is through positivity, love, give them time individually. If you have multiple children, really just carve out, even if it's 20 minutes, just to sit down and really see what they've been working on or look at that cool, you know, Minecraft game or something they've been designing, whatever it is. It's, it's all about the parent lead. So out of the, all of these things, I say the most important is your well-being as the parent. You have to put yourself first so that you're your best for everyone else. And that will set the tone of the family. I already talked about these earlier, just that COVID-19 is really increasing all of the symptoms that have been happening before in our youth. I'll be happy when it's gone, but even then we're going to have a lot of cleaning up to do in a sense with our children. We're gonna to have to really restore them back to being whole again. And then here's just a couple lists of places you can go if you're worried about your child. I personally have gone to the American Center for Psychology and Neurology. At the time, um, the psychiatrist was Dr. Tamer met Wally, but he's now at Reem Hospital, which is why I also put Reem Hospital. But um, the American Center for Psychiatry and Neurology does have pediatric specialist. So in case you're worried about your child, please don't wait. Early intervention, early identification, that is the most important. And that is all. I do have a YouTube channel where I talk a lot about educational things and I'm slowly growing it. So if you're interested in looking at any of those videos, I put the link. My name is Dr. Cara on there. So you can find the videos and like and share, subscribe, all of those good things. And that's all for me. So if you have questions, we have lots of time for questions. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation, Dr. Williams. We really appreciate it. So we'll take questions. I can see um, the chat box. So anyone that has questions, if you'll just um, unmute yourself or put it in the chat, uh, we'll answer those now. My screen didn't change. No, we see costume ideas. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know where that's even coming from. Okay, let's let me see what that means. Any questions? Well, I'll start out with one. I think you were talking about tantrums. Um, what about tantrums in older children? Let's say year seven and eight, so 11 to 14. What are some of the suggestions? And, and usually surrounding uh, not being able to be on tablets or 
play games extended period of time. Yes. So again, you want to look at those four reasons for behavior. Why is this? You know what? I'm just going to close out of this one. I don't need this one. Okay. So why is your child acting out the way that they are? You want to look at that they're having a tantrum, so they're old enough to say either I want control because I should be able to use my tablet or my cell phone whenever I feel like it, or it's more of a um, seeking attention where I know if I get in trouble, at least I'm being paid attention to. So you want to look at, this is not my computer. I don't know why. Someone may have taken over your sharing. If someone can, um, it says Teams, I don't know. Not me, um, I can some, yes, okay, thank you. Okay, because <laughs> I was like, this isn't mine. Okay, but yes, yeah. you want to look at the reason for the behavior, which is why I was saying to really talk with your child. So if your son or daughter is having a tantrum when you try to take their phone, you still take the phone because we're still the parent. However, let's sit down. Why are you so upset when I tell you it's time to get off the phone? Let's talk about this. What were you doing on the phone? Oh, I was trying to finish my last assignment. And you just took the phone. Okay, well, next time, let me know that you're finishing homework. You know, like have those adult conversations, especially with teenagers, because they are young adults. And after they leave home at 18, if they haven't had adult conversations, it's going to be hard for them in college or in workplaces to take direction and to understand there's a structure to things, there's rules to follow, and there's consequences. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have, if you don't feel like um, going on uh, voice, um, you can type a question. Yes. I'll wait while they type. Since I'm the school counselor, I'll just put some things out there that parents. What about um, how do you help uh, your son or daughter with body image issues? Yes, this is a big one, especially now, believe it or not. As young as four years old, they've seen little girls already have body image issues and it grows as soon as they start going to school and they're starting to compare themselves with other girls. Say, and honestly, it happens with boys, too. It's just not publicly known as much, because if you look at TV shows, movies, all that, it's always about the woman's appearance and how beautiful she is. But when it comes to a man, it's like the scruffier and hairier he is, the better. So usually a lot of the times the men aren't the ones verbalizing their body image issues, but they also have them. So let's not ignore the boys. But I feel like as mothers and as fathers, so I, like I said, I have three girls and I put on weights from having all these three girls. And yes, it bothers me on the inside, but I really try not to show that on the outside to my children. If my girls get older and they have some extra weight, you're still beautiful. Your body is walking for you. It's healthy. Your immune system is working. You have the most gorgeous smile and gorgeous eyes. And yes, in my head, I'm like, oh, all this baby weight. But to my kids, they're just like, mommy, I love your jiggly belly. You know, and it's, it's like it becomes this funny thing. And the other day in the car, my, my four-year-old said, mommy, you're fat. And I was like, yeah. And then my oldest daughter was like, mommy's not fat. She doesn't have a big belly. And I was like, yeah, I do. But it's OK. I grew three children. So. You still love me. You know, like we have these talks in the car because it's so important to have those talks, especially as parents. My husband is always telling them you're smart, you're kind. Of course, you're beautiful, but there's more to life than beauty. So you really want to support your child's well-being by giving them those seeds of positivity that grows within them so that they're encouraged to say, yeah, I look different from you. But that's why we're all beautiful. They're not worried about I have to be the same size as her or I have to you know, play the same sport as him and have muscles. It comes from inside. They need to know it's from the inside. Sometimes okay. I We have another question. It says, sometimes you give your child choice, just like when you mentioned earlier, if you don't have dinner, you will not have ice cream. But my child doesn't care either way and throws a tantrum. Okay, so that tantrum is telling you it's about control because even though you've given them a choice, they still want to show you it's my way. So it doesn't happen overnight, but you have to establish the discipline. So I have an 18 month old and we've started the one, two, three, where I'll say, okay, one, mommy said, no, you're going to go to your room for time out and she'll do it again. I'll, okay. Mommy said two. Now you can either go pick up your toy or you're going to go to time out and she'll still, okay, that's three. Mommy said, when she says three, you're going to your room. 
I'll pick her up. I'll go take her to the room, sit her there. She's only one, so she only stays there for one minute. But she knows she's in trouble. It takes time for them to understand, okay, if mommy gets to three or whatever you decide to be your behavior management plan, when mommy gets to this or when daddy gets to this, I am going to get in trouble. So they're going to have tantrums for a while still, but you have to be consistent. And sometimes it hurts your feelings because you have to put them in trouble, but they have to go. And as that behavior becomes consistent, where they know they're whatever consequence is going to happen, then they'll start to take the choice because they don't want the consequence. Okay. And well, if you had that similar scenario for an older um, yes. secondary student, what would be some good consequences uh, for them? Yeah. Okay. She, Electronic. You always got to say sessions for 15 plus. <laughs> okay. Take away the electronics. If they need it for school or something, turn off data. It's all, their whole world is on electronics, unfortunately. So take away those electronics. We didn't need them. They don't need them. They'll learn. We always say embrace the boredom. Number one is take the electronics. Number two can be now they have more household chores for the consequence or they're not allowed to go out with their friends. Um, but don't link the consequences to something they should do like school. So you don't want to say, well, because you weren't good, I'm going to force you to go to this science camp because now they're going to associate hating science with that discipline. So you want to make sure that the consequence is related to the behavior, but whatever they really enjoy doing, that's what you take away. They need to understand it's a privilege to be able to go to dance class or football practice or to be able to drive the car on Fridays. Or to be able to sleep in. You can just say, hey, guess what? Now I'm waking you up at 7 o'clock on Saturday and we're going to go run three miles. This is your discipline. So you have to pick what's going to really get to the heart of that teenager so that they can say, okay, mom, dad, they're not playing around. I'm, I'm going to have to get my act together. Okay. Someone, um, Richard, wants to know, are we going to have a session for 15 plus? Ooh, um, and yes, 15, we can, yes. Um, if you'll fill out, I did leave... Uh, feedback form. And if you can write some of those comments in the feedback form, then we can arrange upcoming. It says 15 plus. I think this covers everything, but specifically, what would you like um, Mr. Harris to be addressed for 15 plus? It's only yeah. four questions. So if everybody would complete the survey. All right. Another Karen says, how can we help as parents with their children, child with too much things going on? Example, a-level exams, university applications, and going to the Army issues. How can we help them take less pressure off of them? Yes, that's a great question. Number one is time management. So sit down with your child who has all these amazing things happening and schedule out blocks of time that they'll work on those projects, and that's it. They don't work on them any more than that for that day. Then go out with them to go get ice cream or let's say, oh, let's go for a walk. Let's go watch a movie. You want to establish that balance with them because when they go to the university, they will have a lot of coursework and a lot of stress. But we want to show them that life continues. It's not all about these exams and it's not all about a university. And you really want to show time management. So, OK, we're going to do one hour on this application today. The next day we're going to do. Um, practice for the university exam, and that's it. When the hour's done, we're finished. We're going to go do something else. So that will help take off some of the stress. And as a parent, you'll get to spend time with your child and see that their well being is being balanced out. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. From Youssef, Mr. Alhamdi. I'm sorry if I messed up your name. Can you please talk about how we can help the child that can't make friends easily and is shy, five years old? Yes. I have my four-year-old who's a little shy. Um, one thing you can do as a parent to kind of stimulate friendship is to put them in an activity that they like. So if they like art, you can find like an art group to put them in. If they like dancing, you can put them in dance class, you know, sports, to kind of get them around kids that like what they like. Another thing is while they're at the playground, a lot of kids will come up to children and say, hey, do you want to be my friend? And maybe your child is too shy to say yes. So you can say, hey, you know what? They seem really sweet. Let's go together to the swings. And you can start by going with them so they don't feel isolated and like, oh, now I have to talk. And just slowly introduce 
talking with them. You can ask the other child, what's your favorite color? Oh, see, they have the same favorite color as you. You know, just try to make it more comfortable for your child to open up when they're with other children. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I see none. Dr. Williams, we really thank you. We thank parents for attending and we look yes. forward to having more. Thank you and everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Bye.